And welcome back to another episode of our reading, review, and discussion of Sean McMeekin's 2021 book, Stalin's War, A New History of World War II. We are finally finishing up section two of the entire book. We are getting very close to Operation Barbarossa. And joining me today to discuss section two, chapter 12, Hitler Bars the Doors. I am joined by none other than my wonderful friend from the land down under uh, Furious Pertinax. How are you, buddy? Good, thank you, Prude. Lovely to... Th firstly, thanks for the invite. Lovely to be a part of this wonderful ensemble for reading this book, uh, which, you know, like you say, was, was 2021, I think you said it was released, and has yeah. has sent waves through, because it's a very fresh perspective on, um, you know, on the the USSR and the, the sort of dealings between the, uh, you know, the Stalin and Hitler and the dynamics in the East, which were, you know, for, for a couple of years, they're very much finally in the balance. So, um, you know, and, and of course, just as we we're talking like pre-record, this build up towards Barbarossa is extremely interesting. And there's a whole lot of, um, there's a great number of sort of factors of play that most people don't know about. So this is a particularly interesting chapter as well. Uh, it's obviously dealing mostly with the Danube and with Romania and Bulgaria. So interesting to get into my, my friend. I know I sent you, um, you know the 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 text not too long ago and mm. prep for this. I mean, have, have mm. you only read this this chapter? I mean, you're already well versed in in the history of the war in itself. But I was going to ask you, what are your general thoughts on the text? Uh, what have you What have you read so far? What do you like so far? Uh, well, I have just read. Uh, I've actually read through this chapter twice. I did it like when you first sent it to me, and then I sort of did like a, a pre read last night uh, in preparation for the stream. Um, but I, I do want to actually read the book. It's just that, as is always the case amongst our circles, that that pile of need to reads and must reads just always grows and never diminishes. Um, yeah, I, I've come to the so, conclusion that yeah. I will never finish what is on my must read to read pile. And I've just yeah. come to terms with it like a like a man with a terminal condition. Like, you know, it's there. That malignant tumor is not going away. I just have to live with it now. And it's going to kill me eventually knowing I'm never going to finish all this reading list. But that's OK. Exactly. Um, we, we, we accept the metastasization of, of, yes, of the we accept, we accept the, you know. We accept the growth of the tumor, that we accept the growth uh, of the reading list, even if we never truly beat it. Correct. Right. Um, <laughs> but but I, I really should, because I think, uh, I think uh, you know, the author here really delves into aspects of the of the sort of what well, I mean, technically, World War Two is going at this point it's you know it, it is very much a hot war uh, particularly with the conquest of um of france and in, in the aftermath of of or even during the course of um the battle of britain but there's this sort of crescendo that definitely builds up to the launching of barbarossa a as we know like even even in in the present context whenever you read an article about it barbarossa is considered the largest scale invasion of of, of history and uh you know and Often it's sort of seen as a monolith of like, oh well, you know, six million Germans march into to the Soviet Union. That's not really true. What you actually have is a predominantly German force that is supplemented with Hungarians and Romanians. Uh, a lot of people don't even know there's a strong, um, uh, essentially, an entire army corps of Italians, um, somewhere in the order of two to three hundred thousand Italians fought in um in the east. Um, in fact, I have like a distant relative who even was in a one of the um. Alpini divisions who fought in you know, outside of Stalingrad. So, um, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't like this sort of German monolith. It was actually basically this sort of concert of the Axis nations marching into 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 you know the the Russian into White Russia into Western Russia. So, um, and and to send six million men into an offensive into into an invasion force takes doing. You know, there's a whole lot of logistics and you know build up that has to. Be undertaken for that to be able to be you know initiated and uh and these dealings with these sort of minor powers you know bulgaria romania um you know i mean obviously hungary isn't spoken about here but you know this whole these treaties between romania and hungary you know the the, the, the partitions of um transylvania and all that you know it's there's a whole lot that happens in a very short space of time you know that leads up to barbarossa yeah i was telling it that we we were wrapping that up in the last part um with chapter 11 that just how much history that we were covering in that chapter that happens in the span of like eight weeks. And you just like, that is rapid mm. fire levels of like diplomatic back and forth military. It's, prepping it's, and it's the Lenin quote, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Where things happen in, you know, where decades happen in, in weeks or yeah. something along those lines. Absolutely. Like, no, nothing happens in decades. Then like decades happens in weeks. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, as you know, uh, furious interrupt me at any point in time that you have some commentary or anything that you want mm -hmm. to reflect mm -hmm. on. And we're going to get right into it. Let's so, do it. Uh, we're at the end of section two, chapter 12, Hitler bars the doors. 
Uh, from Hitler's perspective, Stalin's effrontery had gone beyond all bounds of reason. It was not simply Molotov's aggressive manner in Berlin that had shocked the German dictator, but the concrete dangers posed by Stalin's demands to German interests. The German war effort was dependent enough on Soviet petroleum, grain, cotton, and manganese and other raw materials. Now Stalin wanted a stranglehold over Finnish nickel and timber as well. If the Soviets were allowed to take over southern Bukovina and occupy Bulgaria, the oil fields and refineries of Pleshti would effectively be surrounded, leaving nearly every drop of natural oil available to the Reich at Stalin's mercy. Roughly 83% based on 1940 figures, including Caucasian oil shipped across the Black Sea to Odessa and then transshipped by rail via ex-Polish Galicia in Soviet western Ukraine. Were Red Army troops to garrison the Bosporus and the Dardanelles, while Soviet sappers secured the lower Danube and Delta, Germany would be cut off from the Black Sea at a time when Britain was already blockading Europe's North Sea, Baltic, Atlantic, and Mediterranean coastlines. That whole paragraph, I think, is just mind-blowing because mm -hmm. I don't think the average person knows that, that just how much uh, raw materials were on the Eastern Front. There's, I can't remember which book it might have been. I've got a feeling it might have been Anthony Beavers, you know, because he's obviously written several books about mm -hmm. World War II and, and they're all quite large volumes. I've got a feeling it might be his Stalingrad book because obviously there's a, a whole chunk of that book that is the lead-up to Barbarossa and then sort of Stalingrad's a part of the discussion behind Barbarossa occurring in the second year of the invasion, obviously. But there's a passage in there where he basically mentions that as the Germans, um, like the German soldiers are basically moving out of their, you know, offensive positions to cross that demarcation line between what is German Poland and what is, you know, the Polish part of the USSR that Stalin received, you know, um, uh, uh, at the end of 39, start of 1940, there were literally trains you know, arriving across the border, you know, through like into Warsaw and into these sort of larger uh, Polish cities that the Germans had occupied with raw materials on board. And I had, you know, like nickel and bauxite and coal and, you know, oil on them. Um, they were pulling into the station as the German troops were moving out of attacking position, which is, you know, it's, it's sort of mind boggling to think that on one hand, both Stalin and the realist probably in their own way that something was going to come to a head um, between them, but there was this aspect to Stalin's psychology that was almost a bit, shall I say, naive, you know, and I, I think, I will, actually, there's, I want to touch on another book at the end of, like, this this chapter, because I think it touches on some of Viktor Suvorov's writing in Icebreaker, that in one sense, the Soviets were ready, and one of the reasons they capture, the Germans capture so many troops is because this, a large portion of the Soviet army is on their border, but then it's almost as if Stalin didn't think Hitler would take the bait, but he did. You know what I mean? Like, there's a really strange kind of dynamic at play here. Yeah, there is a lot to consider there, and um, the Surov hypothesis does get mentioned later in this book, so there's a, there's a lot to cover as well. But we're going to carry on here. Uh, heightening the shock of Stalin's refusal to join the tripartite pact on any but the most insulting terms, the Volt's message was delivered just as Hitler was at the height of his power and nearly everyone else who mattered in Europe was coming to pay homage to the great conqueror. In a clear declaration of intent, King Boris III of Bulgaria visited Hitler at Berchtesgaden just three days after Molotov left Berlin on November 14, 1940. Although Boris, with a very with a wary eye on Stalin, did not sign a pledge to join Germany just yet. Over the next 10 days, three more countries sent delegations to Salzburg and signed on the tripartite pact. Hungary, Slovakia, and Romania. Can I stop Meanwhile, there for a sec? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, uh, Prue. Just scroll up to ever so slightly. Um, yeah. yeah, so about the King King, uh, King Boris. It is worth mentioning here, because this is sort of a very similar dynamic to Greece, although with Greece it's a bit more complicated, because if you look at the history of Greece, there are strong Hellenophile um, uh, influences or cultural influences, sh shall I say, both in Great Britain and in France, which is sort of what propelled those two nations to support Greek independence. So Greek, Greece always had this sort of dynamic between being supported by the French and the English on one side, which is sort of liberal, and then on the other side, they were supported by Russia, which was very much this, um, you know, you might say, uh, uh, so the Tsardom was, you know, very reactionary and, you know, very traditionalistic, very much the opposite of, you know, Western liberalism. But because they were orthodox and the Russians and the Greeks have historically had ties, and if you go to, say, like, 
Apostolic Majesty's channel, we ca- we cover this stuff ad nauseum in our Orthodox Autocracy Nationalism series, where you know the the Greeks and Russians have this sort of um, almost brotherly fraternal relationship as a result of the Orthodox Church and intermarrying between the dynasties of Byzantium and and you know the royal houses of Russia, uh, or, or or rather it's you know it's 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 um you know it's ruling dynasties of its various principalities. Um, this is kind of true with Bulgaria as well that. Bulgaria being one of these sort of South Slavic nations, you know, like the Serbs and the Croats, et cetera, have this sort of Orthodox Slavic king, kinship with the Russians and, and historically have had a relationship with them for, for centuries. And particularly in like the post-independence era of, of um, Bulgaria, which sort of occurs in the latter half of the 1800s, um, you know, Russia sees itself as this sort of defender of, of, of orthodoxy in the Balkans. I mean, that's how we sort of end up with World War One in some sense, is that Russia wants to protect um, Serbia. And um, and so on one hand, sort of ideologically, the Bulgarians don't want to be a part of the Soviet sphere. I mean, you know, it's a monarchy they and itself a relatively traditionalistic society, certainly at this point in time. They don't necessarily want to be brought into sort of, you know, Stalin's, you know, grasp shall i say but inversely you know the 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 bulgarians are, are not a germanic people you know they're they're slavic and we sort of know that there's some ambiguity regarding how um shall i say certain aspects of the regime probably viewed the bulgarians and their kin let's not say anymore um and so there's some sort of ambiguity there but it, it it really can't be underestimated the degree to which bulgaria probably felt a bit torn in this regard and so you, you might say, although with the Greek case, it's a fait accompli, you know, Mussolini, you know, rubber stamps the invasion of Greece. And of course, Greece was, then joins the Allies like it's pretty straightforward. But Bulgaria really had reservations about wanting to side against Russia, even though they disagreed with the Soviet regime and they weren't communists. Being a monarchy, they were very much in opposition to, to communism and Bolshevism. There was very much this this sort of recal almost a recalcitrance a uh a, a, a wariness about fighting russians you know what i mean like it's a really really strange um peculiarity that's often overlooked in a lot of western writing regarding bulgaria at this point in time in history hmm. well i would imagine that the i mean both between bolshevism but then also you have the historical ties with the church would certainly make things mm-hmm. complicated on a diplomatic level i mean especially Absolutely. after Italy, you know, even if it's fascist Italy, I mean, you still have the the Rome versus the Eastern churches there as mm-hmm. well. As, um, mm-hmm. but things to things to consider in the backdrop of that, yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and just as a, a very brief sort of secondary point is that Bog, you, you got to think Bulgaria would be looking north of the Danube to Romania and probably looking at lessons from the previous war, where <clears throat> Romania joined the Allies in 1916, and between the Austrians and Germans and Bulgarians, they basically eviscerated romania and you know basically destroyed romania's army within a calendar year even less romania was an active participant in the war for barely 12 months and so bulgaria would have been quite um sort of attentive to the to the notion that yes whilst if even if hypothetically they side with the soviets they're well within the german sphere of influence they're surrounded by the german army and by german allies and you know what I mean? Like, you know, they're, they're well within the coverage of the Luftwaffe and you know, the Soviets are kind of over there somewhere. It's a difficult position for them. In the end, no nation wants to find itself enveloped. But at the same time, had Bulgaria joined the Soviet sphere, which is what we're going to get into, Romania would have found itself in a similar position to World War One. So there's kind of some interesting interplay between Romania and Bulgaria in this specific context. Yeah, I mean, not to mention, of course, you have the the large German ethnic diaspora that would come from uh, all around you at that point, especially. I mean, uh, Jay J- Otto Pohl's work on that about just mm-hmm. how much of the German diaspora that existed in the East uh, would, I mean, that also played a major role, I'd imagine, demographically. Absolutely. We're going to yeah. carry on here. Uh, Meanwhile, the opportunistic Italian invasion of Greece was going ahead. Even if the Italians uh, foundered, the Wehrmacht could easily sweep in via Romania, where German troops were already gathering, and possibly through Bulgaria if permission was forthcoming to clean up Mussolini's mess. In a clear expression of intent, Hitler issued Directive No. 18 on November 12, 1940, the day of his first meeting with Molotov in Berlin, which strengthened the military mission in Romania with an eye to a future Greek deployment. 
After the German conquest of Western Europe, the Balkans looked ripe to fall. Ribbentrop made no formal reply to Molotov's insulting counterproposal of November 25, 1940, but we can get a sense of Hitler's reaction from the way he unloaded on a Bulgarian minister to Berlin. Parafon Draganov, in a three-and-a-half-hour monologue on December 3rd, returning from a triumphant sound round of receptions in Salzburg, Hitler was floored by the aggressive tones of Stalin's response to Ribbentrop's invitation to join the tripartite pact. It had the ring of an ultimatum. After acquainting his listener with Stalin's proposals, Draganov reported uh, to Sofia, Hitler said, quote, that he now well understood Russia's real intentions and reacted strongly, end quote. Germany, the Führer continued, has already had an unpleasant experience with the Bolshevization of Baltic countries, from which we are now frozen out of and can receive nothing. The loss of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania to communism was bad enough, but this would be nothing compared to the spread of Soviet influence south of the Danube, where Germany has a huge and vital economic interests. This was true, and not only of Romanian oil and petrol refineries, mines dotting the southern Balkans supply Germany with copper, bauxite for aluminum, lead, zinc, and molybdenum. There was also chrome, the ally used to strengthen steel and improve its resistance to rust and acid, critical in the production of tanks, warplanes, armored plates, and projectiles. The German war economy needed 5,500 tons of chrome each month to function, of which 2,200 came from the southern Balkans, Serbia, Albania, Bulgaria, and Greece. Another 3,300 tons were shipped through the Balkans from Turkey. For this reason, Hitler told Draganov he could not permit the Bolshevization of the Balkans. Showing that these were not mere words, Hitler promised on the spot, in a written pledge scribbled on a notepad, to send Bulgaria by the end of December 1940, coastal mines, two naval batteries with 17cm and 24cm guns, 9,700 kilometers of underwater cable, and an order of rubber dinghies and pontoon bridges. Hitler promised to ship to Sofia by February 10,000 shells for 15-centimeter howitzers, 10,000 shells for the 105-centimeter Polish cannons, 26,000 for the 10.5 light howitzers, and 40,000 mortars and mines. True to Hitler's word, on December 12, 1940, Germany dispatched a military mission to Bulgaria headed by Colonel Kolz Zeitzler under the command of Field Marshal Wilhelm List's 12th Army. Bulgaria might not have joined the tripartite pact, but it was on the top of Hitler's priority list for winter 1940. Yeah. Just an insane amount of munitions there. Absolutely. And, and it goes to show you to also that, um, uh, how can I put this? We obviously know that there was a famous speech delivered by Goebbels in the aftermath of, um, you know, the, the fall of Stalingrad and the destruction of the Sixth Army, you know, the, his Tatalan Creek speech. Mm -hmm. So that was basically the, the, the public announcement of the, total of German, German mobilization uh, and its war economy sort of gearing up to, to maximize production. But even so, um, even though the German economy was still had like a civilian component functioning in 1940-41, that Germany, even though, and I would take this at face value, that by the end of both the Polish and the French campaigns, the Germans were beginning to run short of certain, you know, munitions and certain, you know, aspects of its military um you know its, its reserves and its sort of um you know like things like spare parts and and you know whatever um that despite that it's 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 major firms and by that i mean you know it, you know i'm talking like you know crop and Rheinmetall metal and um uh you know in terms of war industry making planes as such you know like bmw mercedes-benz man etc were still pumping out an awful lot of military equipment the fact that the, you know, Hitler was in a position that he could on a notepad to sort of scribble 40,000 rounds of munitions to be delivered next month goes to show that German production was still actually quite fantastic at this point like the you know even though they weren't sort of you know you know tightening the screws and you know squeezing everything out of German industry the German war economy was still sort of you know bubbling in the background at a very very considerable rate of knots absolutely Sophia was in Stalin's sights too. Just as Hitler suspected the idea of a Soviet guarantee of Bulgaria had not originated within the Bulgarian with the Bulgarians. On November 20th, a week after the conclusion of the Berlin meeting, a well-informed Bulgarian ministry sent a circular to its diplomats abroad, warning them of the impending Soviet demand for a quote security guarantee or mutual assistance pact. <laughs> 
On November 22nd, Molotov summons the Bulgarian ambassador in Moscow, Ivan Staminov, to demand clarification on Bulgaria's intentions regarding the tripartite pact. Molotov's trusted deputy, Arkady Sobolev, took a break from the ongoing Danube conference in Bucharest to pop into Sofia on November 25th, 1940, the same day Molotov was dictating Stalin's quasi-ultimatum to the German ambassador in Moscow. Taking a friendlier tone, Sobolev promised Bulgaria's prime minister that, quote, the Soviet Union would support Bulgaria's national aspirations not only in the West, end quote, for example, against Yugoslavia, which had sliced off territory from Bulgaria as a result of the Treaty of Noele sur Seine, but also Eastern Thrace, that is, at Turkey's expense. Meanwhile, Moscow that same day, Molotov and Stalin met with Grigory Dimitrov, the Bulgarian secretary for the Comintern. Hitler may have handed the southern uh, may have handed southern Dobrogea over to Bulgaria, receiving for his intervention an effusive letter of praise from the Prime Minister Filov and the salutations of the Sofia press, but the Vots could play that game too. Molotov got things rolling, informing Dimitrov that during his visit to Berlin, quote, we concluded no agreement and assumed no obligations towards the Germans, end quote. In view of the Balkan impasse with Berlin, he warned Dimitrov that immediate measures must be taken to prevent Bulgaria from falling under the exclusive influence of Germany and being used by Germany as a willing instrument. Dimitrov chimed in that the Comintern was already doing all it could, following a course of demoralizing German troops in the various countries, and offered to intensify these operations still further, that Molotov agreed, it is what we must do. We would not be communists if we did not do this, only it must be done quietly. So we're already seeing the fight between mm -hmm. the, the great powers over Bulgaria. And just uh, just to touch on those territorial concessions, it's worth mentioning that the Bulgarians um, did have extensive claims. And to a point, Bulgarian speakers, um, even today, still sort of live beyond the borders of Bulgaria. And, um, and essentially they had... As a, as, a, as a nation, after in the aftermath of the first Balkan War, had essentially achieved the majority of these, uh, you know, these territorial ambitions. The Bulgarians had access to the Aegean via what you might call um, Greek Thrace, um, sort of that that stretch of land that sort of connects Greece to Turkey. Uh, in fact, um, Bulga Bulgaria even captured Adrianople and sort of had captured a large part of what we would call Turkish Thrace today. Um, the Bulgarians also dominated modern sort of Vardasko or North Macedonia, what we call Fyrom, I suppose. Um, and that little sl slit of territory they were referring to in the eastern part of Yugoslavia that was sort of lopped off at the end of World War One, um, Bulgaria had had acquired and held all these between the two Balkan Wars, and when they sort of got ganged up upon by its um, its neighbours in the Second Balkan War, and then following its defeat in World War One. Uh, Bulgaria was uh, trimmed of all these territories, and so there was very much a sort of a revolutionist feeling in Bulgaria that you know, very in a, in a very similar sort of um, strain to the feeling in Germany uh, that you know there are many Bulgarians living beyond Bulgaria, and, and you know, and in, as a result of this dishonourable treaty, um, you know, we have territorial ambitions to uh, bring these people back. So there was a very strong feeling of um you might say commonality between the germans and the bulgarians on this particular sub uh, uh, you know uh on this particular subject anyone who's going to promise you to get your land back is always going to be a very tempting offer especially mm -hmm. I, I to me i would think eastern thrace or the the Turkish territory would probably be one of the more attractive ones, both because you have Absolutely. that you, you have the old wounds of uh, Ottoman territory, but then also, of course, mm. the, the Christian Muslim difference in the same way that very similarly, the Greeks and the Turks have their. Uh, uh, absolutely. And the other thing, too, is if you look at that, uh, I miss the slime between the Bulgarians and the and the what was then the Ottoman Empire in 1912, 1913, they called it, I think it's called the uh, Chalakta or the Kalakta line. And if you were to have, you know, groupings of troops along that border you are well within striking distance of constantinople like it, it's actually um almost fatally close for any power to be that close to constantinople or istanbul um so that's just worth keeping in mind that the bulgarians obviously wanted that sort of to be able to project their power you know so close to um the most important urban center of turkey mm. carrying on here 
Stalin then summoned Dimitrov to the Kremlin and unloaded on him in a manner eerily similar to the treatment Hitler had given the Bulgarian minister in Berlin. Unless the Bulgarians accepted his offer of a mutual assistance pact, the Vaults warned, they will fall into the clutches of the Germans and Italians and so perish. To sweeten his ultimatum, Stalin proposed to support all of Sofia's remaining territorial claims, some dating back to the Balkan Wars of 1912 through 1913 from the Turkish held Midia Enos Line and the Adrianople or Erdine region of Western Thrace, to the Greek held Drama, Kavala, and Degagach. Uh, and to render aid to the Bulgarians in forms of loans of grain, cotton, and so forth, as well as our navy. As for Turkey, the intended victim of many of these territorial adjustments, Stalin told Dimitrov, we, sh we need a base to ensure that the straits cannot be used against us. We shall drive the Turks into Asia. Which, Still, if I yeah, may what, say, what, a, what an offer, what a sweet deal. <laughs> I was going to say that also um, that also leans into an old uh, czarist ambition as well, you know, to, to to free the straits and to open up first Russian access into the Mediterranean, but also to allow them a greater um, free hand to uh, support their Orthodox brothers in the Balkans, you know, the Serbs, the Bulgarians, and the Greeks, because whilst the whilst the Turks were masters of the Dardanelles and the Sea of Marmara, they were hamstrung. So it's funny how even the the Bolshevik USSR, like you know, the, the Soviet regime still would occasionally lean into czarist ambitions for the sake of geopolitics or strategic gain. It's just an interesting little um, you know, insight into the mentality of people who deal with uh, the projection of power. Just, just an interesting point. Well, I mean, you could probably even throw that back even prior to the, the Balkans wars or, czar, or czarist ambitions. I mean, I, just the whole Eastern question in general regarding yeah. the, the, quote, sick man of Europe, which was the Ottoman mm. Empire. But you got you got to think. There's a uh, an AM and I touch on this on on his channel. You know, you have that uh, plan. I can't remember which Austrian emperor it was, but with Catherine the Great, to sort of you know create essentially a, a reconstructed Byzantium centered around Constantinople in the 17th century. And uh, Catherine was to put one of her sons on on its throne. I mean, this is a an age old thing that has bubbled in the mind of the Russians for centuries. Absolutely. Still, he wanted Dimitrov to know that the main thing at present is Bulgaria. In a sign of priority, Stalin now accorded Bulgaria. He informed Dimitrov that Arkady Sobolev was in Sofia as they spoke, and that Molotov would shortly summon Bulgaria's ambassador, Ivan Staminov, to speak in the same vein. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Soviets may not have been as swift as the Germans in dispatching troops and war materiel, but they excelled in propaganda. Scarcely had Dimitrov left the Kremlin and he fired off a missive to the Bulgarian communist leaders in Sofia, informing them of territorial promises Stalin has made to Bulgaria if they signed a pact with Moscow, and instructing them to mobilize our parliamentary deputies and initiate a vigorous nationwide campaign in favor of this proposal, demand its immediate and unconditional acceptance. The destiny of the Bulgarian people for many years to come rests on this decision. Um, I mean, you don't hate commies enough. You, you really don't. But I I think so much of our... <laughs> you of think our, you do, but... <laughs> you, you think you do, but you really don't. We say this about journalists, but you you, you really mm. should be considering mm. how your, your opinions on communists. But I mean, uh, it's crazy yeah. to think. And this is how fast that they had that network. You had the... And the earlier chapters talk about this, the whole new international and, and shaming the socialists to, to be more like communists, lest they be called counter-revolutionary. So everyone was on the same message and how quickly you could get this out via phone calls and telegraphs and uh, messages via missives. And mm -hmm. now you can do that just 20 times faster, uh, you know, if, if not just instantaneously with uh, the internet yeah. we have, Telegram, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, undisclosed channels on Slack and such. Not, not, not much has yeah. changed, you know? The more things change, the more they stay the same. Let's uh, just, just for the for, 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 for a brief moment, let's also spare thought for poor Dimitrov here, who uh, he, who, who copped a three-and-a-half-hour Putin-esque lecture from the Fuhrer um, <laughs> and then immediately got another serving when he flew to Moscow <laughs> and uh, got it from the uh, the Soviet equivalent. And he he's gone got back to both Sophia, barrels. Just, he's, he's, just gone into, he's flown back home to Sofia and just, like, you know, uh, flopped on his couch and slept for three days because he'd just been pulverized <laughs> by, the, by both the fascists and the communists. <laughs> 
poor, poor Dimitrov. Get, gets both barrels from Hitler and Stalin, and then comes yeah. back home to the home country to realize that the communists are like everywhere all at once. Like many, many. There's, cases, there's, right. there's no catching a break. No, no. Uh, it would be an exciting winter in Sofia, relegated by the punitive treaties of 1913 and 1919 to the status of a Balkan backwater. Bulgaria was suddenly at the heart of geopolitics. Some of this was owed to spillover from the German-Soviet showdown in Romania and the Italian campaign in Greece, but it was no less heady for that. Fate, and the fortunes of war, had decreed that the two most powerful dictators on Earth were battling toe-to-toe -to -toe for supremacy in Sofia, of all places, an accidental capital born of great power diplomacy at the 1878 Congress of Berlin. Dimitrov's agents in Sofia salted their agitprop with an uncharacteristic appeal to pan-Slavism, accompanied by the classic communist fake letter-writing campaign with 600 Bulgarian proletarians from across the country wiring telegrams to Premier Filov, all of which, to the Premier's bewilderment, demanded that he invite Soviet troops into his country. Noticing the identical rhetorical style of the telegrams, Filov concluded, reasonably enough, that they had all been written by a single person. Just, just early indicators of biolinism, like you'd think they'd be talented enough to realize that that was a silly mistake. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you'd think, right? You'd think. Meanwhile, hundreds of German soldiers, camouflaged in civilian clothing, began spreading out across Bulgaria in December 1940, gathering intelligence, scouring for supplies, and preparing the way for a German deployment. In a curious mirroring, both sides claimed, with surface plausibility, that their moves in Sofia aimed to thwart British military plans, and yet neither Hitler nor Stalin could have doubted for a moment who the real opponent in Bulgaria was. If this wasn't so tragic, it would almost be comedy. Correct. Uh, like Bilal many Balkan affairs. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, what, what's the old Bismarck quote? You know, another damn war in the Balkans. <laughs> Yes, uh, not, not worth the healthy bones of a single Pomeranian <laughs> grenadier. Filov and the Bulgarians were clearly enjoying the sudden attention in this political war between Berlin and Moscow. So too were the Germans, and once it became clear, they were winning. To be sure, King Boris III and Premier Filov were careful not to declare partiality just yet, lest they provoke Stalin into an amphibious strike on Bulgaria's Black Sea coastline before Hitler's promised coastal mines and shore batteries had arrived to secure it. But they signaled their intentions by allowing German troops into the country in early December, and then dithered for days before responding to Stalin's offer of, mutual, of a mutual assistance pact. On December 19, 1940, the Soviet ambassador in Sofia lodged a complaint with the German embassy that Stalin's proposal was left dangling. The Germans responded blandly that they had heard Bulgaria's foreign minister was ill. Warned by the Germans that he must not give in to Moscow, Filov on December 20th sent a wire to Molotov politely declining Stalin's offer. By the year's end, many German soldiers had poured into what was um, so many German soldiers had poured in that it was difficult to conceal the truth, whatever Sophia's official position was. In a plaintive admission of defeat, Tass announced on January 12, 1941, that press rumors that the government of the USSR had agreed to this penetration into Bulgaria by German troops were false. The playing field was uh, more even in Romania. The Germans were blanketing the country with troops, nearly half a million by the end of 1940. Hitler, by drawing a line in the wet sand of the Delta at the Danubian Commission Conference in Bucharest, had barred the door to further Soviet encroachment in the Balkans. But it should not be forgotten that Russian troops were, or that the Russians were also investing in occupied Romania, that is, the Moldova SSR with troops, tanks, and 14 new aerodromes for the Soviet air forces, with their construction overseen by the NKVD. As in Bulgaria, the Russians did not move as quickly as the Germans, but they were just as thorough in their military preparations. By early 1941, German intelligence was picking up reports that monstrous numbers of Soviet troops concentrated in Bessarabia and Bukovina. Which, uh, I was going to say, if one's paying attention to present-day affairs, which is, you know, the start of 2024 for future posterity, um, Bessarabia, and uh, as a geographical region, um, overlaps with the Moldavian SSR, or what is Moldavia today as a country. And, uh, and that's an important sort of... Um, a sort of geostrategic location because it allows anyone um, either east or west to sort of cross over the, I think it's the Dniester River with, you know, some degree of ease. And 
essentially whoever controls Bessarabia either protects Odessa or finds themselves in striking distance of Odessa. And so this has been a very fiercely contested part of the world for literally centuries on that basis. Um, for instance, Tsarist Russia often use it as, as, as a pathway into the Balkans and to threaten the Ottoman Empire. And, uh, and as we see in 1941, um, for, the, for the Germans, they were actually able to, um, they, they essentially bypassed this in, in the Barbarossa campaign. I suppose we'll get to a future chapter regarding it. And uh, the Germans actually end up surrounding um, uh, Odessa quite early in the campaign. And like as this, as this paragraph st states, the, the Soviets actually did put a lot of troops and a lot of you know, resources and material into Bessarabia realizing the importance of sort of blocking the Germans, but the Germans just sort of drove around them essentially. But it's an important uh, point to, to mark out because it's not just a, an aberration. I mean, this is a very important strategic region and has been for a long time. The one thing I do take issue with this book is I wish there were, I know there, there are a few maps in the earlier chapters, but I wish there were more uh, maps to highlight this as well. But we'll carry Absolutely. on Absolutely. Ma maps are always, always fun in this regard. Absolutely. Um, certainly, you know, who doesn't <laughs> love maps and painting maps? Yes. In Finland, the Russians were holding their own. Although the Germans had signed a defense agreement with Helsinki in September 1940, Stalin had the country positively surrounded. The Red Army had flooded the Karelian Isthmus, guarding the approach to Helsinki with troops, and the NKVD was overseeing the construction of four new aerodromes on the territory of Soviet-occupied Finland, that is, the Karelo Finland Socialist Soviet Republic. The Honko Peninsula, which guarded Helsinki from the Baltic in the other direction, was now a massive Soviet forward base behind enemy lines, occupied by an advanced echelon of eight special infantry brigades that guarded NKVD construction battalions sent to build new bases and modernize the coastal batteries. On November 5th, 1940, the Politburo appropriated 45 million rubles for fortifying Honko. In the view of these aggressive Soviet moves, it was understandable trepidation that the Finnish ambassador to Moscow received Molotov's warning on December 6th, 1940, that if the Finns voted into power any one of the four anti-Soviet, that is, patriotic candidates in Finland's upcoming presidential elections, Stalin would interpret this as a rejection of the Soviet-Finnish peace treaty on the March 12th, 1940, and act accordingly. Lending credence to Stalin's threat, Molotov recalled Soviet military attaché from Helsinki. Most ominously of all, from the German perspective, was the arrival in Petsamo, the same week in December, of a large Soviet team of engineers and trade experts seeking, the Germans feared, to wrest control over Finland's nickel exports. In the absence of maps, it's worth mentioning that even in the modern day, Petsamo is now still a part of Russia and remained a part of the Soviet Union after this time. Uh, but if you look at a pre-war map of Europe, obviously pre-1940, pre the Winter War, Petsamo was actually a, uh, a Finnish holding uh, into the sort of the North Sea. Actually, it separated Norway from from the USSR at the time, so that the the Finns actually had access, um, you know, to the, to the Northern Sea via Petsamo, which was important, uh, as they say, for nickel, as mentioned here, but also, you know, even in terms of like sea trade and even fishing to some point, uh, having Arctic access. The Finns lost that in 1940, and with the exception of a slight uh, brief reoccupation, you know, in the aftermath of Barbarossa, they again definitively lost Petsamo in, I think, 43 or 44, and today remains a part of Russia. So, you know, it, again, if you didn't know the history, it would not mean anything, but if you actually look at the historical context, Petsamo was a, a very vital uh, interest for both the Finns and, by extension, to the Germans. There you go. Let's continue on here. In the view of these aggressive Soviet moves, it was with understandable trepidation that... Oh, I was already just reading this. Forgive me. <laughs> Got to scroll down. Pardon me there. All right. From the Arctic to the Dardanelles, a phony war had descended on Eastern Europe, just as uneats just as uneasy as the Sitzkrieg in the West during the first winter, uh, the first war winter, and in view of the scale of armor on both sides, far more dangerous to life and limb for anyone unlucky enough to be trapped near the borderlands. While the movement of German troops east from France and southeast into the Balkans was generating most the most headlines, Soviet military preparations on the other side of the frontier were on an even larger scale, if not as ruthlessly efficient in logistical execution. 
It was not only Hitler and his generals who were beginning to feel an itchy trigger finger. As early as June 1940, German agents had reported from Soviet-occupied Galicia that the view is universally held in Soviet military circles that war between the USSR and Germany is unavoidable, and that the Soviets will be the aggressors. That's an important quote to keep in mind as we talk about mm -hmm. the Sturov hypothesis later throughout this, uh, this book. The mood in the NKVD, according to a pro-Axis businessman captured near the Romanian border and interrogated by Beria's agents before being let go, was not at all friendly to Germany. In the Soviet leadership circles, he continued, they know exactly what to expect from Germany, and that is war. After the Western powers in Germany have bloodied themselves, the Russians hoped to be in Berlin by 1941 and Rome in 1942. By July 1940, Molotov himself had coldly informed Stalin's puppet prime minister of the Soviet-occupied Lithuania, Vinkas Kriv Mekavisius, that a decisive battle between the proletariat and the degenerate bourgeoisie will take place in the vicinity of the Rhine and will decide the future of Europe for all time. Isn't this what we call in our circles, telling without telling? <laughs> you know, <it's>... Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. That, uh, that, that somewhat does feel prophetic, doesn't it? And also puts to paid the apologia from certain um, you know, from certain sort of aspects of, of this discussion and just wider politics that people have. It's like, oh, well, you know, one day the, you know, the Germans marched in for no reason. I mean, it's clearly evident that there's a massive buildup of the Red Army uh you know, in Europe, and, and really it's a case of like tit for tat where, you know, both sides are building up against each other. But it's not just a case of one as an aggressor, one as a victim. It's certainly not that. I mean, it, it should be clear to anybody that that is not the case. Well, I mean, plus what we're also seeing here is the, in the previous chapters for listeners of the dedicated listeners to the series so far, uh, you have heard Stalin. Beria and Molotov very much repeat the same line, which is that we would love it if the war on the Western Front was bloodier and nastier. So it was so it would be so much easier to just roll over and take over and Bolshevize and make all of the continent communist. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. That was the ambition. Um, but we'll go on here. Uh, Soviet pilots were showing increasing boldness surveilling Hitler's defenses. On, November, on December 9th, 1940, the German embassy in Moscow filed a complaint about nine recent violations of German and Romanian airspace by Soviet pilots photographing German military installations and, alarmingly, the oil refineries of Pleshti. The timing of that German protest note is significant. It was after reading Stalin's ultimatum on November 25th that Hitler called in Draganov and vowed on December 3rd to go all in on Bulgaria. The departure of Molotov's envoy from the Bucharest Danube conference on November 25th to make similar push for Stalin and Sofia marked the end of any real effort to mediate differences between the Romanian German and the Soviet sides on the Delta. According to a Western news correspondent, the increasingly fractious Bucharest conference saw a fistfight break out between the Italian and Soviet delegations. Chad Italians, if I may say so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, on December 17th, just three days before Bulgaria defied Stalin by declining his oppressive offer for a mutual assistance pact. On December 21st, the Bucharest meetings broke up for good. The Danube conference was thus flaming out when Hitler issued his secret order number 21 on December 18th, 1940, declaring that the German army must be ready even before the end of the war with England to crush Russia in a rapid campaign. And there you go. The, I, I, at this point, it's, it is fate accompli, the die is cast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by the end of 1940, I think it's safe to say that both sides are resolved to this uh, this, uh, this course, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the end goal of the operation, Hitler's order continued, is the creation of a protective barrier against Asian Russia along the Volga Astrakhan. Uh, it's, so that's a crazy border to consider in terms of mm -hmm. geographic distance. Especially exactly. um, where Astrakhan is. Well, it's one of those things too, where um, if you look at like the the Don Volga confluence, which basically was fought over in 1942, which is where the Battle of Stalingrad takes takes place, yeah. it's the most defensible line because uh, basically the Volga Don. Sort of, if you go further further up north, if eventually um, uh, comes close to the Oka River, which itself runs in and around Moscow and up to the north. Uh, that is the m most uh, secure and 
a you know profound line of tangible defense yeah uh, uh, before the before the uh the urals so it's either try and make it to the urals or what's the next best defensive line and the sort of the volga astrakhan line that follows the don volga and the ochre basically make for the the most sensible line of defense from a geo sort of strategic standpoint absolutely and i mean that would include taking out you know you, you'd have to take a just a, a clear cut through line from St. Petersburg to Moscow, all the way down to Astrakhan, which gives you access to the Caspian. You've now cut off, um, you know, any access to Tbilisi, Azerbaijan, what would now later in the future be Azerbaijan, um, and mm -hmm. you're bordering yeah, right Baku, next to yeah, everything, all, all, yeah. everything there, which includes the refineries, the yeah. the mines, the the access not only to the Black Sea but also the mm -hmm. Caspian, and then you would be pushing yeah. what's left of the Soviets into. Um, the, the Soviet Socialist Republics of the Stans, you know. Co correct. And that secures like the Ukrainian grain, the Donbass and all the minerals that are there. Um, and and uh, also, if you look at a map of uh, uh, rail lines, both of the Tsarist era and then sort of in the interwar Soviet era, you'll find that had the Germans actually succeeded in capturing Moscow and held it uh, or in any sort of, you know, for any extensive length of time, it would have completely uh, just eviscerated the the USSR's capacity to move around resources and troops, uh, essentially on the basis that Moscow is the centre point of all um, sort of rail networks, everything, in the same way that sort of people say, like, all roads lead to Rome, <laughs> all Russian railways lead to Moscow. <laughs> and without Moscow, they would have had a, a very, very difficult time actually trying to, um, you know, manoeuvre resources and troops around to sort of counter any German efforts. Uh, so there's no um the, the the Germans were under no illusions as to the importance of Moscow, uh, but obviously uh, as we know as things occurred in history, uh, the Germans did not succeed in that in that uh, undertaking. No. Um, continuing on in this manner, in case of the need of last industrial region the Russians have left in the Urals could be paralyzed using aviation. Order number twenty one represented a critical escalation in Hitler's planning for a war of conquest in the east. Having wrung out what could uh, what he could out of the Moscow Pact, Hitler was now clearing the decks for war. But so too was Stalin gearing up for a showdown with his partner in Berlin. If German intelligence reports about the alarming concentration of armor on the Soviet side of the border was accurate, the hitherto undefeated Wehrmacht would have a real fight on its hands. And that brings yeah. us to the end of section two. Just, just if we can sit on this chapter, uh, just yeah, by all means. What, closing, but just scrub just a tad more if you can. Yeah, I'm yeah. uh, just going to make the point that, um, th sorry, two two quick points. One, it's interesting they touch on German intelligence reports about the concentration of armor. So the Germans had a, the Abwehr, which is the German military intelligence service, had an idea as to the concentration and the the number of of troops and obviously tanks and you know artillery and all that sort of stuff, but. What is interesting here, and if anyone sort of reads about the Eastern Campaign you know, to some degree of depth, is that the Germans, when they um, initiated Operation Barbarossa, I'm sorry to sort of spoil things going forward, but oh no, you're fine. I think just, uh, just, I think everyone the, knows what's what's next. Exactly, is that the Germans had no idea they're going to confront the T34 um, sort of let's call it a medium tank, uh, and they were quite shocked when they came across it as, you know, what would become a mainstay tank for the Red Army. And then also they were completely, una well, when I say unaware, they knew a program existed. They just did not realise that the Soviets had them in, in numbers and indeed what their dimensions and specifications were. But the Germans were actually shocked and they confronted the KV-1 heavy tanks uh, in 1941. And the German, uh, the German sort of arsenal at this point, with the exception of... Um, you know, like it's it's uh, uh, what do you call it? like aerial sort of battlefield interdiction brought about by you know like the Henschel one two nines and the the Stukas and you know their their sort of air assets that can be brought to bear on on the battlefield. That aside, and I think with the exception of some heavy artillery and um, you know, like it's real high uh, high caliber flax, you know, like the one oh fives and eighty eights, the Germans uh, are certainly at the like the regimental level had almost no weapons by which to destroy these tanks and in fact even the heaviest german tanks at the time which was a a a long barreled um, or longish barreled uh panzer three with a i think a 50 mil gun and then they had the the bigger panzer four at the point but it had like back then it had the sort of stubby short barreled 75 mil howitzer 
none of those things could actually penetrate, particularly the KV-1, but actually very much struggled even against the T-34 at that point, which brings about an entire sort of rejigging of, 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 um, of the German Panzerwaffe, and it absolutely impacts German tank design going forward from 1941. It basically rejuvenates the German uh, Schwerpanzer, um, the, he the heavy tank program, and also if you look at the kind of vehicles the Germans start bringing uh, to the field in 1943 and onwards, you look at the Panther, look at the King Tiger, um, you know, and their their tank hunting um, uh, vehicles such as like the Young Panther and whatever. You start to see the innovations that the Soviets brought to the field. You know, rolled armor, sloped armor, um, much heavier capacity guns, and the Germans favoring a, a, a lot of frontal armor to sort of basically go for this quantity over uh, sorry quality over quantity um, sort of dynamic at play here um because obviously with the germans they didn't have the same manpower as the soviets so they sort of thought you know how can we knock out as many soviet tanks as possible and how can we preserve our crews as much as possible that was kind of the impetus for that for that um you know change in in trajectory of, of how the germans would design and build their, their 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 armored fighting vehicles the second thing worth mentioning here um that just crossed my mind was um I had a second point. I want. Oh, yeah, actually, about the um, you know, uh, there was a point here about a a aviation, uh, like dealing with the the Soviet sort of you know up to that Astrakhan Volga line, is that there's an interesting pre-war um, sort of struggle in the Luftwaffe between uh, Volta Viva Ernst Udet, who actually ends up committing suicide, who was a friend of Goering's actually prior to the war, Goering himself. Erhard Milch and other um, sort of leaders in the Luftwaffe at this point in time about, you know, the, the way in which the, the Luftwaffe would expand itself and the kind of planes it would build. Um, to some degree, what made the German Luftwaffe so sort of fantastically successful, certainly in the first half of the war as a battlefield interdiction force, is that a large number of its bombers were... Um, uh, if they couldn't actually go into a complete dive in the same way, like, in the way that like a Stuka did, for instance, its light bombers were fast. They could carry, you know, relatively decent payloads for the aircraft size, and they were relatively serviceable, um, and you know had a had a lot of use. Where they sort of struggled is in obviously when they in, during the Battle of Britain, those bombers were a lot less useful against you know British strategic targets, and they didn't quite have the the staying power and the armor to sort of you know in the same way that you might imagine like a B seventeen or a Lancaster or a B twenty nine would you know these, these big behemoth Allied bombers that had you know armor and resilience and massive payloads and long ranges. The German bombers aren't like that, and every sort of large scale program that the, the the germans had just sort of got delayed and eventually just got you know thrown under the table because at the you know but by the midpoint of the war the germans aren't projecting air power and aren't able to engage in a strategic bombing campaign they don't have the crews they don't have the the um the the domination of the skies just nothing in the war is going to make this program remotely useful for them so they essentially abandoned it, like the america bomber program for instance um but uh there were um sort of like divergent courses of thinking leading up to the war between those men, those aforementioned men I was telling you about, sort of within the Luftwaffe and, you know, what kind of resources the Luftwaffe should have and what kind of, you know, aircraft they should design and build and what their uses would be. And, and there was a, a, a sort of a, a poor the Luftwaffe's command, its leadership that understood the utility sort of preceding the America bomber program was the Euro bomber program. And the idea that if they somehow got stuck in a, in a struggle with the Soviets, well, then how could they cripple Soviet industry? And it was the idea of building a bomber that could sort of traverse the Ural Mountains and bomb this sort of heavy industry that the Soviets otherwise had well behind the lines. And you can definitely see that, um, you know, in the, in the way that the war actually turned out, the fact that the Germans did not have such a program ended up being very myopic and uh, went uh, very much counted against them, certainly in the latter part of the war, because once Allied sort of lend-lease and supplies and all this sort of stuff, you know, came um, sort of pouring into the Soviet Union, you know, throughout 1942 and onwards, it's the essentially the resource war, it's the material war that the Germans lose in the East. It's just worth mentioning. Yeah, not to mention that even by the time that they could uh, design things for it, right? I mean, the the America bomber, like you said, was sort of a, a resuscitation. But I mean, you had um, 
the the 264 the 390 the 277 projects as well but i mean even then right initially before hostilities would really kick off the the project was already being planned um with uh with with weva right uh going after the the Luftwaffe mm -hmm. 33 about how do we yeah. how much strategic bombing is going to play in the war with Soviet Union that they were they were game mm -hmm. planning out and I, I think that that's also a good transition point if you wanted to to speak a little bit and then we can wrap up um because mm -hmm. later in this text and you'll get to it as you keep reading it but we will be talking about um McMeekin's thoughts on the Surovov uh hypothesis um and of course icebreaker and the Soviet offense plans controversy because um, he wrote this in his book in 1988, Icebreaker, who started the Second World War. Uh, he argues that it's it's really Stalin using Nazi Germany as the the, the way to kickstart war in Europe. Um, you know, his main idea was is that the Soviet Union is intrinsically unstable uh, conquest. Plus, you had the ideology of an, of an international communist system. Um, if you have permanent revolution, uh, the system has to keep expanding in order to live. Um, and if not, then um, we might have to fight co capitalist countries ourselves. Um, and of course, the Soviet preparations for wars of aggression came in the 20s and 30s, and that you have to escalate tensions in order to make it happen. And that, that's a big part of his hypothesis. And we can talk about it in mm -hmm. depth, maybe as a side chapter or a sidebar to this whole mm -hmm. book discussion. But um, McMeekin or says, might, or maybe a summary stream at the end. We can kind oh, of. Oh yeah, like, uh, absolutely. Of, I might, I might know. just do that and bring a whole uh, stream on. But I think it's important to consider that a round table of friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, it, I think it's important to keep in mind because while McMeekin says it doesn't get enough attention in the West and he doesn't fully buy into it, he does lean in heavily that when you have a system, I mean, one can't ignore the Red Scare or everything that McMeekin has listed with historical documents not just from the British, not just from the Americans, but from the Soviet archives themselves, that this regime had communist agitators, spies, papers, affiliates, you know, fellow travelers, and every Western European country. Never sent... mind bought and paid for politicians as well, as we exactly. since know. Exactly. You know, and... the Harry Hopkins and Dexter Whites of the world. Oh, oh yeah. And uh, yeah. we haven't even, we'll get to it in this book. But we will. We will. if you thought you hated uh, those people before, if you thought you hated FDR before, um, we'll wait till we get to what we talk about uh, American aid to the Soviets. I mean, also, another great corollary text to read with these would be anything written by Anthony Sutton. I, I mean, technological treason and all of his works about American uh, aid to the Soviet Union before, during, and after the war is just mind-boggling how much we, we supported the Soviets as, as the American Absolutely. government. I'm just using and, the and, royal and, we here. Yeah, yeah, and and you got to think on one hand, they charged the, 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 the British a massive bill at the end of the war, and then for the Soviets, it's like, oh, cheers, thanks for coming. And here's yeah. half of Europe, you know, bye. Th yeah, thanks, it, Uncle Joe, you know, <laughs> just... <laughs> yeah, it, it... <laughs> Here, here's half of Europe, um, and, mm. and of course, if if I recall correctly, it's it's uh, Operation Unthinkable is is never. Of course, it never takes place. So that would have been a whole different world. But I, uh, FDR was uh, not for that for obvious no, reasons. No, no, no. And in the end, obviously, Churchill lost his election, and things went the way they did. Just um, just before I forget, I just want to mention another point about the Luftwaffe actually, because we talk about you know Viva and. Udet and these characters is that given the because it was actually competition held as to what the main um sort of battlefield dive bomber would be and the stuka won that against you know it's other competitions i think like henschel put up a plane and um messerschmitt put up a plane eventually um because the stuka was built by a firm called uh, junkers uh, after its founder hugo or Hugo Junkers, um, and obviously the J87, JU87, if you've ever played like a World War II game of any kind, you know, you know the Stuka back to front. Like it's it's almost singing the me memory of any millennial that ever played, you know, like Medal of Honor or Call of Duty or, you know, Battlefield 942 or something. Um, you know, you know exactly what it is. Or you've seen the movies, for instance, you know, if you could remember that um, opening scene from uh, Enemy at the Gates, you know, where they're sort of strafing the Volga. Um, it's quite a memorable um you know you know visual thing and, and of course if you know you know those sirens are so iconic the horns of jericho like even though they got taken off the planes in 1943 they were only on them for a couple of years you just you know it, it's I, one of the pilots wanted to put them back on <laughs> yeah exactly yeah because they terrorized the opposition you know very much a psychological warfare thing is that 
when it won its uh you know the the trial the for the competition thing for its you know its, its adoption into the Luftwaffe um I can't remember the exact outline of, of of how this sort of came to pass or who eventually whether it was Goering or someone else but if, after the success of the trial they um they made it so that all bombers had to at least be able to engage in a partial dive and the thing is if you've got a single engine sort of monocoque you know airframe plane like the Stuka is even though the Stuka is a bit on the chunky side with its gull wings and its fixed uh, landing gear you know it, it was a competent aircraft for its thing and the fact that it actually provided a, a stable platform for dive bombing um the the thing is that you know if you get a larger airplane particularly like you know like a ju88 or you get like the henschel 129 something like that it's on the slightly larger size like these two engine even on even if they're a light bomber they're just not designed to dive <laughs> they're not designed for that maneuver um and their strengths lay in you know other areas and one of the interesting thing is that you know I, I I don't buy into a lot of the sort of liberal assumptions about you know like for example I can't remember the book that he talks about but Carl often talks about the uh, was it uh, there's a book called like the Vampire Economy or something that's sort of like a lot of the the books of talked regarding German rearmament and it was you know whatever uh, but there are some there is certainly degrees of truth between power struggles within certain elements of the firstly the regime but also within various arms of the military you know like. With the navy have the the sort of traditional surface fleet um proponents like um air raider and then you've got the more submarine orientated um you know proponents under uh donuts and, and and so on and this is also true in the in the luff offer and um and there were those who very much favored a, a more even spread of, of aircraft you know some heavy bombers medium bombers light bombers dive bombers you know high altitude interceptors fighters that sort of stuff um and i can't remember where i read this because it was actually only in the last like 12 months or so but Goering made a boast about i don't care necessarily about what the bombers can do i care about the number because when i you know i can boast to hitler that you know i have this this many henschels and and you know junkers and whatever in the aerodromes of of the reich rather than what can those planes do and that's the thing that we end up seeing certain last half of the war is that you know the, Ger Ger the germans do build some very good um like battlefield interdiction aircraft and whether it's a single engine or double engine or or, or sorry yet yeah, the one or uh, single or dual engined um tactical bombers or die bombers um they're very good at their job but they actually have certain limitations you know there's the germans have, end up not having anything with a, a really significant payload and it comes to bite them in the bag first in the battle of britain and then of course there's absolutely no capacity for them to engage in like a euro bombing program the germans simply do not have the aircraft and a part of it is this sort of you know like i said i i, I don't know if you'd use the word corruption maybe it is corruption but like i said like that boast by Goering about it's about the it's about the number of bombers on the spreadsheet that matters not what they're capable of and the Germans come to find out the hard way that that's not how you should organize a military, if you get what I mean. Well, I mean, the the drama and battles within a, like even the post-war American Air Force over designs, jets, acquisitions, um, shoddy materials. I mean, there's a whole, I mean, just the drama, for instance, behind things like the F-104 Starfighter with respects to like our exports to the Germans or um, US-British relations over like the Harrier program. I don't know how much you could say it's quote unquote corruption. Um, perhaps there's definitely, I, you can't ever rule that out when it comes to the military industrial complex of any regime, but also just the competition and, and what, what resources you have available. And of course, uh, design and management for projects. I mean, there's, there's a lot to go into there, not to mention competition for requests for proposal. I'd have to do some more serious research into the acquisition and testing process of the Luftwaffe, but I, I don't know how much of it you could just flat out write off as corruption, but also just management and uh, competition. Yeah. I, I think also too, there's always a, a, an element of ego to it as well. I, I'm sort of I hate to use the word, but whether it's individuals, let's like say for example, you have that power dynamic within the Luftwaffe of you know Goering's at the top, and you know on one on one hand he's sort of celebrated as a, as a war hero, being you know like a, a co-pilot of the famous you know Manfred von Richthofen and the Red Baron, but then sort of underneath him you've got you know, I mean, Uded ends up committing suicide. You know, you've got Viva as well. Uh, you know, you've got um, people like Erhard Milch and um, Sperl and, and these other sort of air generals 
that uh, obviously competing for influence, you know, within their individual um, arm of the armed forces, but then also everyone sort of trying to gain Hitler's favor as well. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a very, it, it makes for a very opaque, um, you know, way of trying to see things. And funny what you say about the American industrial complex, you know, you sort of look at like the various firms involved with aircraft construction, you know, like Grumman and Lockheed Martin and, you know, so on and so forth. And, you know, trying to get the defense contracts and trying to, you know, make the budgets match up and make the best aircraft and the smallest resources and all this sort of stuff. You know, it's, 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 it's a story as old as, 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 as time in regards to the military industrial complex, right? A tale indeed as old as time. Um, but with that, Mr. Pertinax, where can people find you and what do you do? Uh, mostly, if you fancy following my odd Twitter musings, you're welcome to follow me at Furious Pertinax. And uh, I sort of I tend to sort of uh, jump from uh, from streamer to streamer. So I was on with AA last week for Unpopular Opinions. And, um, you know, we, we obviously every so often you invite me kindly onto your channel. And we talk about mostly things historical or geopolitical, which is always fun. Uh, probably due to have a chat with Charlie at some point, which I don't know if, if you're going to be there as well. I presume that we're going to have a roundtable with Charlie regarding, you know, Ukraine part 17 at this point. <laughs> so uh, that should probably happen soon. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I do have some ideas on the boil with AM. We just have to uh, sort of see how we uh, tackle 2024. But there's always things to do, as you know. There's plenty of history for us to canvas. Um, and also next Saturday I'm doing... Um, uh all going well i'm doing part two of um our reading of R my reminiscences of africa which is uh the the memoirs of one uh emil von letter vorbeck and his east africa campaign in world war one so if that interests anyone check it out yeah i do recommend hitman's work he's done some great stuff he and i did a two-part series about the lines in the sand and the legacy of the um sykes Pico agreement so uh, by all means be sure to check out furious there uh this will be out uh, if you're listening of course uh when this premieres publicly you gentlemen uh, of course who are listening to me right now are the lovely paid subscribers patrons and backers channel members etc you are the wonderful people that lets the series keep going and do what i do so i thank you so much um when you see this live by all means i would encourage your financial support you get to see episodes of this series early as well as see my other works that are behind the paywall um, yeah, absolutely, Mr. Pertinax. I mean, you're one of my favorite people to come on and talk about geopolitics, history, and maps. So thank you so much for coming on. I imagine that you will be on with another chapter uh, or two uh, as we continue on with the series because we've only finished section two. We've got quite a bit to go. And this is, as you can tell on the top there, if you can't tell, on um, this PDF, I'm on page 216 of 844. So we've got a lot to go through. There's um, a lot of meat left on this bone, one might say. Yes, there's a lot of meat left on these bones. <laughs> we have a lot to still chew through. Um, but with that, uh, Mr. Pertinax, thank you so much for coming on. And Thank you, um, Brute. Much appreciated. Thank the, you, everyone, the, for the, watching. The series will continue.